the intersection of endurance sport, health, fitness and life. Challenging conventional ideas and empowering people with the science of self-propelled motion. This is the Endurance Experience Podcast, hosted by Tony Rich. Hello everyone and I am back on the Endurance Experience. The summer race season is a busy time for us so that's taking up a lot of time so here we are though back again and thanks for sticking with us I remember starting in endurance sport nearly 20 years ago now since then the participation rates have increased exponentially and the last time I looked at the numbers about a million people we're finishing marathons worldwide. And the number of half marathon finishers were about double that, about 2 million per, per year worldwide. Overall, you know, people are running 5Ks more than anything, about 3 million per year worldwide. And all of that doesn't even count the popularity of triathlon, Ironman, trail running, and ultra marathons. The pre-COVID participation rates for triathlons show somewhere between 400,000 and 500,000 participants per year worldwide. You often heard me say on this podcast that self-propelled motion activities are the most efficient means of getting fit and staying fit. I still hold to that, and I think I can pretty solidly defend this empirically. Yet, it seems every couple years or so, a paper is published analyzing the potential detrimental effects of prolonged endurance training on the heart. So is there a tipping point? where endurance training can be detrimental to a person? To help me explore this question on this podcast, I invited on an expert, and he is Professor Graham Stewart. He's a cardiologist and focuses on congenital heart conditions. He has clinical interest in cardiac electrophysiology in children, and adults with congenital heart diseases. He also runs a clinic for inherited cardiac conditions and has a research interest in exercise and the heart, as well as sports cardiology. He's an honorary associate professor in sports and exercise cardiology at the University of Bristol and an honorary research associate at the University of Exeter. And Professor Stewart himself is an avid endurance enthusiast. He has completed multiple Ironman distance triathlons and has an interest in rowing as well. So, needless to say, he is uniquely qualified to talk about uh, this topic. So we talk about how the heart works, and Professor Stewart really breaks it down for the layman, and he describes what's actually happening during endurance exercise. We touch on the differences in heart characteristics among sex and populations, and then we talk about the latest findings in cardiology about uh, the potential quote-unquote long-term effects of training for endurance events like marathons and Ironman distance triathlons and whether or not there is uh, significant evidence, empirical evidence, of adverse effects over time. We talk about uh, sudden death and when, when athletes die suddenly in endurance events, 
what generally is the cause and what type of heart related issues should give an athlete pause or concern what precautions should athletes take with age and can wearable technology help spot issues and we talk about the latest in cardiology about COVID and the impact of long COVID and whether or not there's any more clarity about what long COVID is. And we talk a little bit about the return to sport protocol for an athlete after getting COVID. And finally, I get Dr. Stewart's uh, perspective on what we might see in the future, either from wearable technology or whether or not we will actually see in the future a fully implantable replacement heart or some form of mechanical heart. So it's a very interesting discussion generally and very important for the endurance enthusiast. So without further delay, I give you Dr. Graham Stewart. Dr. Graham Stewart, thanks for coming on to the podcast. Thank you for inviting me, Tony. All right. Um, I want to talk about a few things in this podcast. Uh, the endurance athlete's heart. Uh, I want to talk about just generally how the heart works. And uh, I want to talk about uh, the effects of long-term uh, and consistent exercise endurance exercise on the heart and uh, what can we learn from cardiology about that uh, i want to talk about sudden death when people die during uh, endurance events what's generally the cause and uh, how can people be vigilant to spot problems and then i want to touch upon covid and long covid and uh, whether or not there is a, a cardiologist recommended return to sport protocol and then finally i want to talk about uh, the future of technology and, and technology with hearts and you know what we might see in the, in the future but first how about we start with just a, a general in your own words so your background in, in cardiology and how did you get there yeah thank you um so yeah, I'm a consultant cardiologist in Bristol in the southwest of England. Um, we cover a population of about five to six million people. And there I work particularly with uh, people who've got congenital or inherited heart disease. So that's more or less everything except those who've got coronary artery disease, smokers related heart disease, which mm -hmm. um, so that's what I do. I've been a consultant. For about 30 years, and uh, I've actually now celebrated 40 years working in the National Health Service, which seems remarkable, given that I'm only 27 years old. Oh, wow. Congratulations. <laughs> or so I tell my grandchildren. Um, I have an interest in exercise personally and professionally. So I, I'm a runner. I've done a couple of Ironmen. I recently took up rowing and rode the Atlantic in January this year. Really? Wow. So I, I understand endurance sports I, I, as a, an individual, albeit not very talented athlete. <laughs> and my research, is, I'm a professor, or associate professor in the University of Bristol of sports and exercise cardiology. And my research is largely looking at the adolescent elite athlete's heart and also prescribing exercise to people with heart problems. So that, that's my kind of background. And which uh, Ironman did you do? I'm curious. Right, so I did. I did one uh, in Elba, which is a non Ironman franchise, okay. Ironman, and another one in Regensburg, which is in uh, Germany. They only held it once, I think, a few years ago. It was a, it was a great Ironman. Yeah. Oh, that's impressive. So you definitely have a, a unique perspective about uh, what's happening. Um, that's great. So let's start here. So f for the layman, you know, let's pretend that. Uh, you know, people come in from another planet. They don't know how human hearts work. Let's let's start there. And and how how does the heart work? And how how would you describe what's happening with the heart during an endurance event like a marathon um, or an Ironman? And then from there, maybe we can talk about 
heart size and differences between uh, sex and populations. Sure. Well, the heart, the heart is an amazing organ. It's essentially an electrical pump, or rather it's two pumps. Um, one pump takes, uh, each pump's got a top and a bottom chamber, a top collecting chamber known as the atrium, a bottom pumping chamber known as the ventricle. And basically what, quite simply, uh, the right side of the heart takes blue blood coming back from the body. That's blue because all the oxygen's been used up. It collects it in the right atrium, that ejects it into the right ventricle, which sends it to the lungs. And in the lungs, it's oxygenated and then gets sent back to the left atrium, which then pumps it in, uh, flows it into the left ventricle, which pumps it around the body. In the body, the oxygen is used up and so it goes on. So that's the kind of plumbing side of the heart. And very importantly, it's electrically controlled. And so there's a network of, if you, you think of it like wiring within the heart, it's, it's just modified muscle. Mm -hmm. But there's a, a part of uh, the top chamber of the heart called the sinus node, and that initiates the heartbeat. And that's sensitive to things like adrenaline. And that changes quite a lot with exercise and endurance exercise. It sends impulses down through the top chambers, the top chambers squeeze, sends impulses down through the bottom chambers, and in sequence, the bottom chambers then squeeze. And so that, that's the, the electrical and the plumbing aspects of the heart. Wow. Um... That's incredible. And then how, how many beats just, uh, I don't know if you know this, but uh, how many beats does the heart take in a, in a lifetime? Bill millions, hundreds of millions? Oh, oh. yeah, we're talking millions here. The, I mean, if you think about it, the average heartbeat will beat for what, 70, 70 beats a minute, 24. Yeah. I mean, it's the, it's the one bit of the body that cannot rest. Right. It's quite important because if you think, if you have, um, say you've damaged your leg, um, and you're an athlete, you rest it to let it recover. You can't rest the heart. Uh, you, it has to keep going up, otherwise you, you don't keep going. And that's why um, uh, in rehabilitation after a heart issue, it's quite difficult because you've got to take that into account that the heart will keep going, but mm -hmm. sometimes avoid stressing it. And we'll come back to that maybe when we talk about COVID. Yeah, and that's interesting. And so if you were to look at look at a heart, uh, immediately after uh, an Ironman, say, let's say you didn't know what happened to the person and you you, you could see their heart. What, how would you evaluate it as a cardiologist? Well, I mean, people have done this. The, uh, after the Nice Ironman a few years ago, a, a colleague called Andre Lagarche did exactly that. He did an ultrasound scan, an echocardiogram of athletes completing the Ironman triathlon. Mm. He also did a blood test and he found that Essentially, every single one of them, the right side of the heart, the right ventricle was enlarged. The left ventricle was slightly small, uh, usually due to dehydration. And um, when he did a blood test, he found that uh, a level of a um, uh, substance called troponin was elevated. Now, troponin, if I was to have severe chest pain, was to be taken to my local hospital, they wanted to know if I was a heart attack, having a heart attack, they'd measure troponin. And that's a, that's leaks out from damaged heart muscle cells. And in those athletes competing a triathlon, they had levels of troponin in their blood equivalent to that seen after an acute myocardial infarction. So, and that's led to a whole debate is, is this sign of heart muscle damage after that sort of extreme sport, or is it a, some sort of compensatory phenomenon? We Honestly, we don't really know. My own view is it probably does represent some mild damage, mm -hmm. a little bit like, you know, when you complete a, an Ironman, if you're really well trained, you're pretty exhausted, uh, your legs ache a bit. If you've not trained so much, your legs are very, very sore. I guess it's the same with the heart, yeah. a sign that you've probably pushed it too hard. Most of these abnormalities recover within a few days. Right. I see. And and I want to, we will get back to the the effects, the long term effects of, of of this type of exercise. Um but I think that's that's interesting. I think when you're doing you're doing an event, an Ironman, you're doing 14 straight hours, 15 maybe 16 straight hours of aerobic activity. Interesting. So, uh, are there are there differences in heart size between uh, sex and populations? I'm I'm asking this just to figure out uh, whether or not this is something uh, that means anything for for training purposes, I mean, 
you have uh, you know people living in different altitudes. People say that the the Kenyans were born and grow up and and live in different altitudes, um, and maybe that's the reason why why they dominate and the East Africans dominate so well. Or maybe that's this one part of their uh, um, of the characteristics the characteristics of their dominance. I'm just interested in just this sort of general understanding of the differences in heart by uh, by sex or sure. populations insofar as they, they, they may exist? Um, well, the, the first point is that there's a difference between a non-athlete and an athlete's heart. Mm-hmm. And there is a phenomenon called athlete's heart. And so, for example, if you're exercising your arm muscles, they get bigger, they get stronger, they look different to somebody who never does any arm exercise. Right. It's exactly the heart. And so when you have an assessment, say if some uh, cardiologist is doing an ultrasound scan of your heart, it's important that he knows that you're an athlete. Otherwise, he could make an uh, incorrect judgment. He may think that the muscle is thick due to right. as it's thick due to exercise. So that's the first point, the a- athlete's heart. And sometimes it's quite difficult to sort out the difference between what is exercise-related changes and what is pathology. In terms of um, gender differences and also racial differences, um, there is quite a significant difference between male and female hearts. The male heart tends to develop many more features of athlete's heart in terms of thickening of the heart muscle, etc. than the woman's heart. And there's, we know a lot about the male athlete. We know much less about the female athlete, particularly the older female athlete. And we're just now teasing out some of the differences. You know, you'll be aware that we're seeing quite a lot of endurance records now being beaten by women. Mm-hmm. Uh, beating the records which were, might have been held in the past by men. And the, clearly, it's, it's uh, in the UK, for example, the Land's End to John O'Groats marathon run, the record holder is now a middle-aged lady uh, and uh, you did it remarkably quickly. Her heart will look quite different to a middle-aged man who's done that level of, of exercise. So there are gender differences. Right. There's also quite important ethnic differences. So I, I work with the Football Association and various other sporting organisations. And when we're looking at uh, an ECG, which is the electrical trace from the heart, or an ultrasound scan, which shows the, the anatomy of the heart, it's important to know the ethnic background. So an Afro caribbean guy will have a slightly different heart to a Caucasian guy. And um, mm. that's... Uh, uh, one of the difficulties is very few people now have a pure ethnic background. Lots of us have a mixed race, and it can sometimes there be difficult to tease out what's a racial change versus uh, uh, an exercise change or, again, pathology. So there is the big differences, and there's some populations that we're just starting to learn about, like the Maori and the, uh, some of the other smaller ethnic groups that, that are different still. Yeah. And when you say different, you mean by size, right? So certainly the the, the description you just gave about how it works is the same. Is are the differences mainly size differences, or are there other differences? Yeah, there's electrical differences as well. Um, so um, on the ECG, for example, um, there are things called T wave changes, which are uh, an electrical sign of the heart muscle recovering. There's T wave changes that are very common in somebody from an Afro Caribbean background. But if you saw them in a Caucasian athlete, would be rare and probably represent pathology. Wow. And it represents the genetic diversity. So there's more genetic difference between a guy from West Africa and a guy from East Africa than there is in all the Caucasians, because supposedly man originated in Africa and therefore the genetic differences are much greater. It's it's a fascinating thing. And it's not better or worse, it's just different. Different, right. And on on average, how much larger is the male heart than the female heart on average? Uh, you've got to take into account um, you know, physical size as well, because of course most men are bigger than, than right. Women. But there are there are slightly different um, normal ranges, uh, not yeah. just millimeters. We're not talking much more than that. Mm-hmm. If you think of the average heart as being roughly the size of your fist, then. You know, clearly men have got bigger fists than women. So right, right. that sort of order of magnitude. Interesting. Okay. All right. Um, so let's talk now about uh, 
the long-term effects of, of, of training, endurance exercise, like marathons, Ironman, distance triathlons, and then the training that comes with it. Uh, you know, every couple of years, I see some articles from, you know, different uh, cardiology departments about the, the adverse effects. So I'm wondering now, has the has the evidence changed? What What is uh, the collective body of knowledge from cardiology saying about the long-term effects? And can we, uh, can we understand any sort of threshold of lifetime training that is either good or bad? Well, I mean, the, the first point to make, Tony, is that uh, there's absolutely no doubt that taking part in exercise is good for your health. So it's easy to get carried away with the, the downside. And there are some downsides, but, but by and large, they're overwhelmingly swamped by the benefits. So you reduce your likelihood of bowel cancer, breast mm -hmm. cancer, you reduce your likelihood of heart attack, you, you reduce your likelihood of dementia, uh, a whole host of, of improve your mental health, a whole host of things that are actually very, very good. Um, the, the question, I suppose, is, first of all, what does exercise do? Well, um, it, there's a specific effect in the heart, but it also affects other areas of the body. So the, the th from the cardiovascular standpoint, there's the heart itself, there's the blood vessels, and there's the skeletal muscles. And the skeletal muscles become more efficient if you exercise. So there's these little energy-producing organs called mitochondria in the skeletal muscles. And if you exercise, they become bigger and they become more numerous. And so my research, a lot of that is people who've, whose hearts are maybe two-chambered rather than four-chambered, they're not going to get better. But if they get their skeletal muscles more efficient, they'll be able to do more with the same heart. So big skeletal muscle benefits. Blood vessel benefits, um, when you go out, run up the stairs, your hands and feet get warm. That's because the blood vessels dilate. And by regular exercising, they get better at dilating. The vessels are less stiff. Now, all our blood vessels get stiffer as we get older. Uh, so exercise can preserve the youthfulness of your blood vessels, if you like, which is a really good thing. From the heart itself, uh, one of the things you'll notice for people particularly doing endurance exercise, they tend to have a slower heart rate. And the reason... Right. There's several reasons, really, but the output of the heart is calculated by looking at the heart rate and looking at what's called the stroke volume, which is the amount of blood pumped out for every heartbeat. And as the heart gets bigger, it, it doesn't need to pump out so frequently. Uh, right. rest, the heart rate slows. And it does that through a couple of mechanisms, one of which is increasing vagal tone, which is the vagus nerve that slows the heart rate. So if you get a whole bunch of endurance athletes to... Uh, sit down, you give them a lecture, get them all to stand up, quite a few will feel dizzy. And that's a very, very common phenomenon in, in uh, endurance athletes. And that's because the heart rate takes a while to get speed back up again. And that's mostly vagal tone. But also, we've learned a lot recently that there's a, a thing called down regulation of, of the funny channels of the heart, the IKF channels. And that's why uh, you know, some extreme endurance athletes, maybe the Tour de France Cyclists may have heart rates in the high 20s or low 30s, and that's downregulation of the, of the IKF channels. Mm -hmm. um, so th these are the main consequences of, of normal physiological consequences of training. In terms of adverse effects, um, one of the few adverse effects in endurance exercise is an increased risk of a, a rhythm called atrial fibrillation. And that's where the top chambers of the heart go into a very rapid irregular rhythm. Uh, and that's four or five fold increased in long-term endurance athletes. Wow. And, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very common rhythm as you get older anyway. You know, something mm -hmm. 1%, 2% of 60-year-olds, you know, 5% of 65-year-olds, 10% of 70-year-olds have this sort of rhythm. But it's higher in endurance athletes. And there's many, many potential explanations for this, but it, it certainly is true as it's the case. How does that uh, translate into uh, something actionable for the endurance athlete as far as as far as training is concerned? Right. So, you know, the average uh, 
recreational athlete or even slightly competitive athlete, yeah, you might train if you're training for an Ironman, you might you might train, you know in a week you might you might train maybe an hour a day or maybe a couple of hours a day if you're really competitive. Um, is there any uh, sort of upper upper limit to to training? A professional athlete might do several hours a day. <laughs> so, but then I guess also it might come down to time, right? If you're a professional athlete, you might only do that for maybe six years, six to ten years. Uh, I'm trying to figure out the magnitude of of training to where it might uh, become more adverse than um, than not. Well, there is a sweet spot mm -hmm. uh, in terms of cardiovascular mortality or all cause mortality. The sweet spot is round about 10 or 11 hours a week. Mm. And so there's a U-shaped mortality curve. So if you're doing nothing, then your mortality is right up there. Right. Uh, as you do more and more exercise, it keeps falling until you're doing round about 10 or 11 hours a week. Once you go past that, it starts to climb again uh, slowly. So by the time you're doing 21 hours, it's, it's nowhere near as high as if you were completely sedentary but it's, it's higher than if you're doing 10 or 11 hours. And it, again, the reasons for this are not entirely clear. That's an observation, um, an epidemiological observation, but uh, atrial fibrillation might be one component of that. And the way Actually. an athlete go there in atrial fibrillation, uh, usually it's something that affects middle-aged athletes rather than younger athletes. It's rare in young athletes. It affects particularly the bigger athletes, there's a relationship with body size. So the taller you are, the more likely you are to get atrial fibrillation. Uh, and there's also a genetic element. If both your parents have had it and you're an endurance athlete, you have a significantly higher chance of getting it. <clears throat> and a lot of the you know things like the Apple Watch and the Samsung Watch, the ECG watches, what, one of their modalities is to pick up atrial fibrillation. Yeah. And so, yeah, so... Apple Watch has this. Um, there's one called Cardia that I that I use, and, and they also they'll detect di different arrhythmias. Something called bradycardia and tachycardia. Um, so, do you think that these are effective uh, effective tools uh, from a cardiologist standpoint? Are uh, yeah. I mean, there's some. Uh, if it costs you thirty pounds, you get it from the internet. It will not work. <laughs> the ones like Cardia, you've mentioned the Apple Watch, the Samsung, the Fitbit, they all have a, they use very similar technology and they work. Um, you, you've got to be careful in the interpretation that they will give you automatically. So, um, I mean, I use them a lot with athletes and quite often I recommend athletes get them. You know, if somebody's having intermittent flutters of the heart rate uh, and it's only when they're exercising, one of the best ways of documenting that is to have a Apple Watch or a, a, a Charge 5 a band that, that monitors atrial fibrillation. And then you can actually store a PDF of the rhythm, not, not just the heart rate, but the actual rhythm, and send it to your cardiologist and they can confirm it. But So I, I, I test all these devices when they come out to see if they work because um, when athletes come to me with it, I like to see what the accuracy is. And so I, I'm currently using the Charge 5, and it's automatically an, an analysis of my rhythm always says inconclusive. And that's because it's below 50 a minute because I've done long-term endurance exercise. That doesn't mean it's, it's abnormal. They just say inconclusive. So an athlete that relies solely on the algorithm to know what it means may think they've got an abnormal rhythm, whereas that's, that would be an entirely normal rhythm for somebody doing a lot of exercise. Right. Okay. So, yeah, that's a good sign that these uh, this wearable technology is is working. It, it's giving at least good information that you could supplant with uh, actual doctors' uh, recommendations. And um, so, how about we talk now about uh, so periodically in, in you know whether it be triathlon or marathon events. Uh, 
we will see athletes will suddenly die in, in an event. In, in triathlon, it's usually during the swim. Uh, but there, it's not a lot. It's not a lot. We're not talking about big numbers per year. Uh, it's, I haven't looked at the numbers lately, but periodically you'll hear about it. And um, when when this happens, uh, do we know generally what the cause is? It maybe it's adverse reactions from atrial fibrillation or some other uh, pre pre existing conditions. Uh, do we know generally uh, when this happens, why it happens? Yeah, I mean, first of all, atrial fibrillation is unlikely to cause sudden death, um, which is the good news. It can cause other things, um, the worst of which is strokes, mm -hmm. but by and large, it would be unlikely in itself. The vast majority of people who die suddenly in that context have an undetected, unsuspected underlying heart problem. So it might be an electrical problem. It might be a structural problem. There's so-called cardiomyopathies, fancy mm -hmm also doesn't work but the, that's one of the common causes um so that and that is the rationale for doing pre-participation screening so it's certainly in the united kingdom every teenage footballer who gets a professional contract will have an ecg and an echocardiogram and the idea is to pick up the detectable uh, conditions that may uh, prove um, dangerous on on exercise the problem with the pre-participation screening is it doesn't pick up everything. So last week we had a British footballer at a cardiac arrest uh, on the football pitch, and he will have had several screens. So it's not perfect, mm -hmm. but uh, usually it's due to an undetected underlying heart problem. For the older athletes, uh, heart attacks, you know, coronary artery disease are quite an important cause. And uh, there is... G genetics versus environment and if you've got uh, if your father and your uncle had a heart attack at age 42 even if you're a non-smoker and you had your cholesterol checked you are then at increased risk of a heart attack exercise will reduce that risk but it won't necessarily you know, remove it completely and james fix the famous uh, endurance runner uh, he di tragically died of a heart attack uh, yet yeah being a long-term marathon runner, and you know, that can happen. Yeah. And it, is it fair to say that if you've done events, um, many events, I mean, and athletes will have uh, race histories where they've done many marathons, many Ironman. Is it fair to say that if you've done those, you would have exposed something if it were, if there was a problem? Uh, or can or is that uh, not not a? Sadly, that's not always true. So, yeah. for example, I mean, if, again, if I look at the soccer world, um, you know, we've had famous soccer players who've had cardiac arrests, having played professionally for twenty years. Yeah, it's not always true, and what's difficult sometimes is to tease out what it was specifically about a particular game, a particular event that made it worse. There are some guidelines, though. So, for example. If you are feeling unwell, if you have a viral type illness, if your muscles are achy, you should not go out training. And that's because some of these uh, viruses affect the heart muscle and you won't be aware of that, particularly the ones that cause stomach upsets. And so that's why you shouldn't, you shouldn't train when you're unwell. Um, there's, a, there's other factors. So, for example, some of the stimulant drinks um, that are marketed to improve endurance You've got to be very careful with them, particularly if there's lots of caffeine, because and they're banned in some countries, like Germany, for example, wow. because they initiate an abnormal heart rhythm. Really? Wow. Um, <laughs> there's a lot to think about there. What about the swim portion? Of, oftentimes in triathlons, in the swim portion of the event, you'll hear about it. Again, it's not many, but sometimes people will uh, um, suddenly uh, pass away in the swim portion could could uh, stress uh, or so you know just sort of you know, sympathetic nervous system response be a contributing factor in that? Uh, I mean, the short answer is yes. The, the swim 
portion in triathlon, you're absolutely right. That's if you're going to die in a triathlon, then that's the, often the time it happens. And there's several reasons for that. One is, uh, as you know yourself, it's the so-called washing machine. You're in there, huge adrenaline surge. You're getting your goggles kicked off. Uh, you're trying to get out of the out of the crowd. So really pumping adrenaline. But at the same time, you're offering cold, often in cold water. So what that's doing is it's you've got adrenaline coming from your sympathetic nervous system. The cold water stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system. And that combination in susceptible people can lead to an abnormal rhythm. It doesn't in the vast majority of us. Wow. And if you've got some other cofactor going on, if, if you'd uh, three cans of an energy drink beforehand, put that all together, you know, that could just make it, uh, make it a problem. Also, there's, some, there's a condition called um, swimming-related pulmonary edema where uh, it seems sometimes to be related to high blood pressure, where the heart doesn't fully relax. And that, in the combination of huge adrenaline, can sometimes lead to uh, build up of fluid in the lungs. Again, it's not perfectly understood, but it's, it's, uh, it's why the swim portion is, is worse. And finally, there's some underlying electrical um, uh, conditions called channelopathies, long QT syndrome is uh, probably the most common, where this combination of cold plus adrenaline, you dive into water, that just leads to the abnormal rhythm. That is something that would normally be picked up. Yeah. Previously. Interesting. And so, you know, there, you know, are many people listening to this and you're probably feeling like, wow, that's a lot there. Now, I, I want to keep doing these events. I've been doing them for years. Uh, what uh, what, the, what should they do? Uh, what, how should they talk to their doctors? Or uh, what procedures should they talk to their doctors about to just have greater insight and spot problems, potential problems? Well, the, the first thing is common sense. Um, you, If you're going to do a, an endurance event, train properly for it. Uh, you know, there's a tendency where you think, oh, I've done an Ironman. Yeah, I'm going to manage this half Ironman without really doing very much. And that's that's not good for you. You probably can manage it, but you you may be straining things that bit beyond, um, beyond ideal. And, and also to recognize as we get older, I see a lot of athletes, I speak as somebody myself, I'm in my early 60s now, and I have to realize that when the 24-year-old shoots past me on the bike, you know, I'm not going to catch him. And mentally, I'm going to catch him. But physically, well, it's a lot more difficult. Yeah. And you, you have to curb your competitive instinct. And that's one reason, for example, why I, why I moved into rowing. Different sport, different challenges. I'm not comparing my times with what I did before. So common sense. Second thing is to choose your parents carefully. <laughs> uh, because genetic influence is an important one. If you know that there's a high instance of cardiac disease in your family. Um, coronary disease, heart attacks, well, you can greatly reduce your risk by not smoking and also by doing regular exercise, but you should have your cholesterol checked because if uh, there's been lots of heart attacks, you're treating cholesterol. There's good ways of doing that now with diet or with medication, and that can greatly improve your risk. Um, so there's the common sense sort of things and if you have a first-degree relative who has had a major heart problem, you died suddenly in their 30s or had a defibrillator, one of these things, you should be checked out um, because these things are genetic and, and they can all be treated, but uh, you have to know about them. Yeah, that's certainly good advice. I mean, I myself, I, yeah, as I've gotten to the latter half of the 40s and you know, racked up a pretty significant race count i mean i've done almost 100 total marathons wow. uh and several iron man but you know uh and i've been in you know pretty uh good shape um and but still uh something like blood pressure in in african americans is elevated it doesn't matter you could be an olympic athlete and for Reason I'm told that uh, they're still not completely understood. Blood pressure is elevated in in African Americans. So I did a, a litany of tests. I did a uh, you know a cardiac recently a cardiac CT, 
I did a sort of patch monitor where they put a patch on you and they monitor monitors your heart over some days. Uh, a cardiopulmonary test. You know, these are things that I don't know are are are, are normal. I think I think these were precautionary, right? Things that you you evaluate. But uh, you know, I think what you're saying is true. Is that uh, as you get older, don't don't just make the the normal uh, mistake of saying, "Oh, I've done I've done a number of events. I'm fit, and I don't have anything to worry about." It's probably good precautionary procedures to to take part in. Yeah, yeah I think that's true. One of the the things you have to be careful of is most cardiologists don't deal with athletes. And so I would seek out a cardiologist who's familiar with the athlete's heart. Uh, now, what you've done, I think, is very sensible. And uh, knowing that you're, if you have a history of high blood pressure, knowing your coronary CTs are fine, that's really good to know. I mean, we all get narrowings of our coronary arteries as we get older. That's what happens. But knowing that you're not sitting there with something that might cause you a problem is 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 good to do. Unfortunately, there's a cost to that, and therein lies the, the problem. So even in the UK, where we have a National Health Service, you cannot get these tests done on the National Health Service because you have to be ill. It's really, really not a health service. It's a sickness service. Um, really? But uh, you, So you have to pay privately. But I suggest, you know, if somebody's wondering about this, uh, if they've got any of these risk factors, like a family relative who's had a problem or... Um, if they've got a twinge that they're worried about. And uh, I suspect most middle-aged athletes, when they're running up the hill, they feel a slight tightness in the chest, then, gosh, is this something I need to get checked? Well, the answer is yes, you do. Um, and it may be, you know, I had that and I got checked and there was nothing there and miraculously the twinge disappeared. You know, so it was just an awareness of your own body. But uh, it's, it's important. You, know, you want to... There's so many benefits from doing that sort of exercise, but you just want to make sure you're not putting yourself at risk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and I know people just want to continue doing it. And I've started to think about that now. What what is the sort of end game? And as you know, people do these in their 50s, 60s, even 70s. They've got um, a couple of people even in the 90s. I saw uh, a news article about uh, Sister... Madonna Buter, she's a, a nun who um, she com she completed several Ironman in her eighties, and she still races racing now, short course in the nineties. People want to do these events in their you know late stage later stages of life, and you know trying to figure out now, okay, what is the end game? Maybe you slow it, slow the uh, slow it down. Uh, maybe you don't train as much or train as hard. I think the U shape, uh, uh, the U shape uh, characteristic of training that you described, well, the, uh, that is that's compelling to hear about, right? So ten to eleven hours a week, sort of the sweet spot. I think that's probably where most recreational athletes are. So it's uh, very compelling. I, I have a, a good friend Ken who uh, I saw recently after. I hadn't seen him for a while in the pandemic and he stopped and we were chatting and uh, I said, how are you doing, Ken? He, do he does lots of exercise. He said, I'm, I'm not too happy. I'm down to, I'm doing 10 and a half minute, 11 minute miles. I said, can you remind me how old you are? Well, he's just celebrated his 90th birthday. Oh my goodness. <laughs> wow. Man, uh, who's had heart issues and, and he's, uh, he's kept competing and, and he's, you know, uh, it really does make a difference to your general health. So, that's I often tell you know, middle aged athletes that's what you want to be doing. So you just have to curb your your competitive instinct and listen to your body. Mm -hmm. if you are feeling something out of tour, out of kilter from normal? Get it checked out. It's pr probably nothing, but get it checked. Mm -hmm. Let's, uh, if we can, uh, move on to COVID and the the impact of COVID. I know there's a lot that we're still trying to digest about COVID, but I do know uh, an, an athlete who was a pretty well-known athlete, runner, triathlete, uh, borderline elite, 
And I think uh, he got COVID before the vaccines was, were available. And um, and so uh, he has what's called long COVID and has been unable to to train or compete since. Um, so why why is uh, COVID problematic or what it, what is long COVID? Uh, and and now that we have vaccination, is there a is there a cardiologist recommended return to sport after getting COVID? Right. Well, I mean, the, the first point is that, that COVID itself can affect the heart, but only in a tiny minority, uh, particularly if you've been vaccinated. So um, I, there's various papers have come out over the last couple of years as we learn more about this condition. But inflammation of the heart muscle is of the order of anywhere between one and 15 percent. But that depends how hard you look. So if you look very, very hard, you'll find some inflammation. But actually, that's probably true after most viruses. Um, inflammation of the lining of the heart, pericarditis is of the order of 1% or 2%. And if you measure that, that uh, substance troponin in the bloodstream, it can be elevated in as high as sort of 5 6 7%. So we know that COVID itself can affect the heart. Um, but the vast majority, it doesn't cause any long-term effects. Uh, there is uh, a subgroup of infants where they get, most infants are barely affected by COVID. There is a subgroup where it can affect the heart very badly, and we don't quite know why they get that. Mm. Um, in t terms of long COVID, uh, we don't really understand long COVID yet. It, it certainly exists. Uh, it's a bit like post-viral uh, ME, as it used to be called, after, which you can get after any virus. And it seems to be excessive tiredness and uh, inappropriately fast heart rates. Nobody's quite sure why this happens. It's probably a, a sort of excessive immune response of the body to the viral effect. Uh, it does seem to get better, but it does take a long time. And I think it's, this is something we're learning about all the time. It, it exists. It can be quite unpleasant. And mm -hmm. what you've described in the, uh, the chap who the, was the semi-elite runner triathlete it, it does happen and it, um whether going back too early is a factor we don't really know but that's one of the reasons why there are fairly clear now return to play guidelines and um there's a number of these have come out so by and large for most people most of the guidelines would say you shouldn't really exercise until you're about a week free of symptoms and when you start exercising again, you should have two weeks where you're really not pushing yourself hard. Um, and you listen to your body. If, if you're struggling, then you ease back. Um, and for the normal recreational athlete, that's probably good advice. So basically, seven days free for symptoms, then a couple of weeks of just gradually don't push yourself hard at all. Um, for the elite athletes, there's, again, a number of different um, protocols for return to play um, most of which involve if there's no symptoms the, you don't really do anything you, you use that seven days um, free from symptoms two weeks gradual return <clears throat> if there are symptoms or ongoing symptoms then we would look with an ECG and an echocardiogram and if there were any abnormalities at all suggesting inflammation of the heart or the lining of the heart then we'd proceed to other tests you know, MRI scans or whatever and, and would delay going back. Having said that, you know, I just did a row around the north of Scotland and on the last two days, um, one of the previous rowers had, had, had left the boat and said, really sorry, guys, I've got COVID. And I was coughing like fury for the last two days. We rowed 50 miles that day and uh, I turned out I, had, I was COVID positive. So I wouldn't have chosen to, to row, uh, but I did do and it didn't affect me. So that's... Just to say it doesn't always happen, but right. my own advice, I would have stopped rowing. I, I didn't know I had it, and I was in the middle of the ocean. But, uh, you know, it, it, seven days free, from, just let the body rest. It goes back to this thing about if you have an injured leg, you rest it. With a heart, all you can do to rest it is not exercise. Yeah, and I think that's the hard thing, especially for the endurance athlete. You you know, you got you got some event on the calendar. 
you're following a program, you, you know, you're watching your fitness improve, and then all of a sudden you get hit with something. And you don't want to see that progress decline or turn around. And so, oh, I'll just do a little bit on the bike, or I'll just go out and just do a, <laughs> a little run. Um, but yeah, I mean, this used to be, um, you know, before before COVID, people would train through a cold all of the time or train through, uh, you know, some flu. Um, but I think you're right. Rest is always uh, important and uh, necessary and probably the best course of action in these uh, situations, yes. Yeah, I think so. It's just it's just wise, you know. They, what they used to say is anything below the head, don't exercise. Uh, All right, you know, yeah, yeah. You know, a slight head cold, you're probably okay, probably. Trouble is with COVID, that's changed because for some people, COVID is no more than a slight cough or tickling the throat. And it seems to have a, uh, it has a bigger effect. So I think, yeah, rest is key. You're missing a week's training while you've not lost anything. If you train through it, make things worse, you right. could end up on COVID and that you've lost a lot. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's great. Um, how, do, how about we finish up and talk about uh, what you think uh, is going to happen in the future? Maybe put on your uh, cardiology crystal ball. <laughs> Take out your crystal ball. Uh, and I'm always curious about what we're going to see in the future. And uh, I don't know how, how many people are on a yearly basis are on waiting lists for for heart transplants. And I'm just wondering, you know, whether or not in the future we would see ever see a fully implantable replacement heart. Um, whether it's mechanical or or it's an organic heart, uh, do you think we'll ever see this? Well, we're we're close to it. Um, the The problem with heart transplants is twofold. One is the insufficient number of donors, and animal heart transplants haven't really worked to date. That may change, but they they haven't uh, been successful to date. Um, so the first point is not enough donors. You, you, if you need a heart transplant, you'll be put in a list because there's no heart available. The second problem is rejection, and the body constantly will reject this. You have to take anti-rejection drugs, which in themselves can, can cause problems. So a heart transplant can transform somebody, but it's not a cure. It's swapping one problem for another. Mechanical hearts have come a, a long way. So if you go on YouTube, you'll see people with mechanical hearts swimming up and down a pool. You'll see them running. You'll see them doing all sorts of physical exercise, and they, they are hugely better. The problem is they always are attached by a cable to a battery, and therein lies the, the issue because we don't, haven't yet solved the problem of, of uh, the battery. Um, that may well be solved. Uh, who knows how they, they, they will do that, but... Um, actually, it used to be that people who were really struggling would be put on a mechanical heart as a bridge to transplantation while waiting for a heart to appear. Quite a few now actually have stayed with the mechanical heart because actually in terms of lifestyle, that's worked for them. Um, and if they can't get a heart because of antibodies or whatever, then that can lead to a remarkable quality of life. So a mechanical heart that's connected outside the body to a battery. So you can see this, I've seen a wonderful YouTube video of a guy doing, doing freestyle up and down the pool, but his partner's walking, he's right beside the edge, his partner's walking down holding the, the battery. So and that, of course, is a limitation. But, you know, the technology is amazing and the, the ingenuity of man is amazing. So I think that will be solved in due course. I suspect mechanical hearts will be the future. It's not my area of specialism, but I watch it very carefully and uh, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, we had a, a company back actually in my home state uh, where they had one, um, I think it's called Abio Med, and they created one which they were hoping to be uh, 
a fully implantable. And I, th I think one guy lived with it for maybe 500 days or something like that. But I see the the challenge of a <laughs> how do you keep it going? And right, what you were talking about earlier, where the heart never never stops throughout an entire lifetime. That's just amazing. We can't create anything like it <laughs> with any battery. Yeah, not yet. But you know, battery technology they can now apparently print out photovoltaic cells on something that looks like paper. So who knows what's around the corner? Uh, it, it will get better. A bigger challenge would be to try to prevent the need for heart transplants. And, and that means uh, dealing with the conditions that cause it in the first place. And there's in uh, the UK just now, we've just, um, our Heart Foundation has just allocated 30 million pounds to about $40 million to uh, this genetic advances in cardiac research, mm -hmm. producing drugs that can snip out abnormal genes that, that left untreated will lead to heart damage. So there's that side of things. So prevention is better than cure uh, if we can actually prevent many of these conditions from actually reaching the stage where the person needs a heart transplant. Right. And all in all, uh, as you said, there's a net benefit to exercise and endurance exercise. And um, I think we always uh, want to talk about the adverse effects of endurance exercise, but I think you're, you're spot on when you say that we don't talk enough about lack of exercise as well. And it's probably more problematic that you'd have adverse effects from that than too much. Well, exercise. Absolutely. You know, if, if a drug company marketed a pill called exercise, it would make a fortune. The problem is, you know, when I, uh, in my work, if I want to put in a $50,000 defibrillator, nobody raises an eyelid. That's fine. If I want to employ an exercise physiologist to uh, lead in an exercise prescription program, people say there's no funding. Uh, and because it doesn't have the commercial backup, it, it doesn't have this sort of zing of fancy technology, but it's actually very, very important. And you, we would save far more lives if we got the population more active than, uh, than you know, your new transplant technologies, for example. Yeah. Well, that's a, a great uh, point to end on. Uh, I thank you for your time, Dr. Stewart. And where could people find you out on? Uh, are you on the platform, social media platforms? Yeah, so I, I'm uh, Sports Cardiology UK is my little company. Um, uh, we're on the we're on Twitter and we're on on the web. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm round and about um, here and okay. there about. All right, and I I hope that you continue to continue to train. Maybe do another Ironman in the future, and or certainly continue the rowing. Absolutely, thank you. All right, thanks a lot. It was nice to chat to you. Thanks again to Professor Graham Stewart. Let's hope that he gets a book out there one day. I would love to read it. All of his information is in the show notes. Check him out. He's on Twitter at AG underscore Stewart. Key takeaways for me, both as a longtime endurance enthusiast and a coach. Number one, the most important muscle in your entire body is undoubtedly your heart. And just as Professor Stewart talked about in the first part of the podcast, your heart never stops. Okay, and just checking the numbers on this, your heart will beat about 100,000 times in one day, about 35 million times in a year, and during a lifetime, the heart will beat more than 2.5 billion times. So the heart being the most important muscle in the body is one of the reasons why I say that uh, self-propelled motion activities are the most efficient means of getting fit and also staying fit. Second takeaway is that there's a U-shaped mortality curve where 10 to 11 hours of training is the quote-unquote sweet spot. And so if you remember, Professor Stewart described that U-shaped 
mortality curve. And so on one end of that U-shaped curve, you have the person doing zero training on average. And then on the other end, the mirror to that is the person completely overworking uh, uh, their uh, cardiovascular system doing 15 plus, 20 plus, and so on hours per week of training on average. And so the sweet spot being 10 to 11 on average. And so the fact of the matter is there aren't many athletes that are doing substantially north of 10 to 11 hours per week on average, say in a year or something like that. If you think about it, in you know, seven days in a week, if you're doing two hours of training per day, that's 14 hours there. So uh, I don't think the average, certainly not the average recreational athlete, but perhaps a professional athlete might do that. But even even they would take the off season to substantially recover and get the uh, recovery that they need on average. So I would say that you're far more likely to have adverse experiences and adverse consequences as a result of a sedentary lifestyle than you would ever have as an endurance athlete. So in some ways, the uh, alarmist and the heightened awareness about too much endurance training is overblown relative to the uh, potential con consequences of not training enough or not doing enough activity. The third and final takeaway from my discussion with Professor Stewart is regardless of your uh, athletic history, your performance history, your race count, as you get older it can't hurt to uh, see your doctor and do as many evaluative uh, procedures and assessments that will allow you to identify and take precautions for any uh, unforeseen conditions. And in, uh, based upon Professor Stewart's evaluation, some of the wearable technologies out there, the Charge 5, Cardia Mobile, and uh, Apple Watch, they all have uh, features that can help in that uh, endeavor. But obviously don't use them in place of sound recommendations from your primary care physicians and your cardiologists. Now, with that being said, I want you guys to get out there and start training. Go ahead. Go, go, go. Go. You got an event coming up. Get out there. Take care of that heart. And I do want to say it's good to be back in front of the microphone. Got some great podcasts coming up. You won't be disappointed in the Endurance Experience Podcast. Follow Event Horizon Endurance Sport on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for training programs and services to become a member of our Endurance Institute or for a complete archive of podcasts, log on to our website, eventhorizon.tv.